the end of the Middle Ages, a mighty nation arose on the borderlands between Europe and Asia. A land called Russia. A dynasty of Viking princes would lift Russia to greatness. The greatest of their line, Tsar Ivan the Terrible, would cast Russia into chaos. Out of the ashes would rise a giant, a new Russian empire, and the man who created it, sailor, soldier, carpenter, Tsar, Peter the Great. Russia. In the words of Winston Churchill, Russia is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. Even today, years after the fall of communism, Russia retains a sense of mystery, and Russia's history remains a riddle. There's no question in my mind that there is not one Russia, but that there are many Russias. And there's also very little question in my mind that there are many different uh, uh, Russian histories. Is there a Russian nation? Yes, there is a Russian nation. Uh, what is it? Uh, a thousand different things, depending on what you want it to be. What makes Russia particularly different is, firstly, its sheer size. It is, after all, the biggest country on Earth. And secondly, I suppose, the fact that it is Europe, but then again, it isn't quite Europe. The enigma that is Russia begins long ago, before Stalin, before Lenin, before the Reds took power, Russia was ruled by the Romanov dynasty for 300 years. Yet even the Romanovs are relative newcomers. The birth of the Russian Empire reaches back over a thousand years to an age when history tangled with myth and a nation found its identity in a mystical faith. At its peak, the empire of the Tsars would span one-sixth of the globe. From the glories of St. Petersburg and Moscow, across the endless forests of Siberia, to the shores of the Pacific, and beyond. The land which is currently Russia is, of course, enormous. The distance between one end of the Russian Empire and the other end of the Russian Empire is the same as the distance from Moscow to Chicago. And part of the story of the history of Russia is the filling up of that space. The land that would be Russia was never a single country. The Russian people, never a single race. Turks and Slavs, Mongols and Finns, Russia is a nation of many nations. A land not of one people, but of many different peoples. All those groups have different patterns of settlement, obviously speak different languages, and have no sense of, of, of being part of a coherent land at all. Before Russia became a nation, what connected the people of the Eurasian frontier were rivers, endless, awesome rivers. Rivers were the highways, rivers were the roads, the rivers were the connections between the widely scattered populations. The rivers provided the force lines drawing people together. The rivers are absolutely essential to the expansion of the Russians in every direction and to the creation of this kind of enormous state. Without the rivers, they could never have held it together. In the ninth century, Viking warriors sailed down the rivers at the edge of Europe. The Dnieper, the Don, the Volga. The Vikings pioneered new trade routes, a shortcut to the riches of the Orient, Arabia, and Constantinople. Natives along the rivers call the Vikings the Rus. And as the Vikings battled and bartered their way to power, the frontier between Europe and Asia became known as the land of the Rus. Russia. One of the stories of Russian history is how gradually links are forged in a very small way. Strands emerge, beginnings of connections happen and begin to intertwine. Then one turns around and, good heavens, we have a place called Russia. By the late 10th century, the land that would be Russia was a patchwork of warring city-states. Rival Viking princes battled for supremacy. The greatest of these ancient cities was Kiev, and Vladimir, Grand Prince of Kiev, 
was the most powerful man of the land of the Rus. But Vladimir wasn't content to be first among equals. The Grand Prince sought greater power, to reign over the Rus as a God-given ruler. One of the things which a would-be ruler of that large and diverse land needed was some central focus of authority, some sort of central cult which would give him a legitimacy and authority beyond simply the use of military force. In the legends of Russia's birth, Prince Vladimir searched for a single religion to bind together the many pagan peoples of the Rus. According to ancient texts, Vladimir sent out emissaries and met with the Jews, the Muslims, and the Catholics in a quest to find the one true faith. Then his men came to Constantinople. Here in the heart of the Christian Orthodox world, Vladimir's envoys at last found the power and glory their Grand Prince craved. The envoys went to Constantinople and were so impressed by the sheer aesthetic beauty of it. We saw such beauty there, we did not know whether we were in heaven or on earth. We only know that God must live in that place. Constantinople's might and splendor helped convince Vladimir to convert to the Orthodox faith. Then, as God's agent on earth, he commanded his subjects be baptized as Christians or face his wrath. Prince Vladimir had united the land of the Rus with religion, but at his death, he left his kingdom divided among his sons. Civil war between rival brothers threatened to tear the kingdom apart. One of Vladimir's heirs, Sviatopol, was determined to rule all by himself. But he feared that his brothers, Boris and Gleb, would stand in his way. Boris and Gleb were not interested in seizing power, but Sviatopolk doesn't trust them. He's described in the text as lawless, as though he were outside Christian morality. And he decides to kill them. Boris was alone at prayers when his brother's henchmen found him. He knew a fight for the throne would tear his beloved land apart. He chose instead to die without resisting to die to save the soul of Russia. Murderous drama was repeated as the killers slaughtered the tyrant's other brother, Gleb. They fell upon him like wild beasts and overcame him by piercing him with sharp blades. Sviatopolk's treachery ignited open war the Rus arose to avenge the blood of the martyrs. Ironically, the tyrant was driven into exile. While Boris and Gleb were invested with divine power, canonized as the first saints of the Russian Orthodox Church. Their sacrifice consecrated the new faith of the Rus with holy Russian blood. That's the significance of Boris and Gleb. They're innocent sufferers. They accept the blows of the lawless Sviatopolk, and in accepting those blows, they act out the passion of Jesus. In the bloody slaughter of Boris and Gleb, Russia's church and Viking rulers had achieved a holy glory and divine authority. For Russia, the blood had just begun to flow. In time to come, invaders from the east would turn the land of the Rus into their stomping grounds, the Mongol Khans of the Golden Horde. In the year 1237, having conquered the eastern world, the Mongol Horde, the sons of Genghis Khan, unleashed their fury on the west and the land of the Rus. The Mongol Horde was the greatest war machine in history. Tens of thousands of men on horseback, organized to murderous perfection. In just three years, they subdued almost all of Russia. In over a thousand years of history, only the Mongols would ever accomplish that feat. 
They came in huge numbers. They came prepared for long-distance campaigns. Their campaigns would normally have between maybe 50,000 to 100,000, and if we're to believe some sources, well in excess of 100,000 uh, soldiers. Mongol warriors trapped Russian armies and cut them to pieces. They captured Russian princes and held them hostage. They torched Russian cities and left them in ruins. In 1240, the Mongols' leader, Batu Khan, the grandson of Genghis Khan, laid siege to the soul of ancient Russia, the city of Kiev. His messengers sent a warning. If you surrender to me, you will be forgiven. If you resist, you will suffer greatly and perish cruelly. Kiev chose death. Refusing to submit to the invaders, the greatest city in the land of the Rus was reduced to a smoldering ruin. Some accounts claim that when the Mongols rode on to the west, they left Russia littered with the skulls of the dead. So began the reign of the Golden Horde. It would last for two and a half centuries. The Mongols are going to create the largest contiguous land empire the world has ever known. They saw as almost part of their birthright, as almost part of their divine right, that they ought to rule as much of the world as possible. The leaders of the Horde were Mongol warriors. Their soldiers were Eastern Turkic tribes. In time, the Russians would call them all Tatars. Yet the Tatars never sought to occupy Russia, only to dominate it through tribute and terror. Their use of horror had been honed in the conquest of Asia. There are a number of instances where the Mongols in Central Asia would lead out parts of the population onto an open plain where they would systematically uh, kill the population, sometimes decapitate them. Murderous Mongol yoke reduced the princes of Russia to underlings. To hold on to his throne, a prince came to the court of the Tatar Khan, literally cap in hand, to feed the horses of his overlords. After his humiliation, he would pay the Khan a lavish tribute, the price of princely power. So long as the Mongols got what they wanted, so long as they got the money and men which they required, then that was fine. They were not interested in any more. They were not interested in settling in Russia, particularly. They were interested in what they could extract. It was a, a parasitic existence, but it's not in the parasite's interest to kill the host. The Tatar Khan would choose one prince to rule the Rus in his stead. The donor of the richest tribute was awarded the honored title Grand Prince of Vladimir, the Prince of Princes. Brother fought brother as rival Russian noblemen competed for the prize. The Mongols had divided the Rus. Only a united people would be strong enough to resist their rule. Over time, the lords of one city learned to hold the Mongols' favor, even though their city was an upstart, barely a century old the city of Moscow. Moscow was founded as an isolated river outpost in the 12th century. But by the 1300s, Moscow was a growing city built around a great fortress, her Kremlin. In 1325, Moscow's prince, Ivan I, cut a deal with the Mongols. Ivan would collect tribute for the Khan not just from Moscow, but from all nearby lands as well. His role as taxman soon won Ivan the nickname Kalita, money bags. Moscow learned to use the Mongols well. The Muscovite princes over time will come to monopolize the title to the Grand Prince of Vladimir. And they could not do that without Mongol support. As Moscow grew, of course it had more money than anyone else. Uh, and it could assume military leadership. Uh, of the Russian principalities, of which there were, what, 50 or probably more. Yet as their power grew, 
Moscow's princes chafed under the grip of the Khan. Over time, the Muscovites acquired the resources to build an army and turn against Russia's oppressors. In 1380, Dmitri, Moscow's new Grand Prince, rallied over 50,000 warriors from across the land. On the banks of the River Don, Prince Dmitri led Russia into battle for freedom from the Mongol horde. They swept into battle like two powerful storms, their weapons glittering like lightning. Blood flowed down the valley and mixed with the River Don. Tens of thousands died. Prince Dmitri himself was pulled near dead from beneath a pile of corpses. The prince survived. The Russians had won the battle, but the Mongol yoke was by no means broken. One hundred years of struggle for freedom had only just begun. There was no set piece occasion on which the Russians said, Mongols, you are going. And the Mongols said, oh no, we're not. And the Russians said, oh yes, you are. And the Russians then threw them out. Uh, the end of Mongol rule was, was a process, not, a, not an event. As internal power struggles splintered the Mongols into rival factions, Moscow rebuilt and grew. By the late 15th century, the wealth and power of Moscow's new Grand Prince, Ivan III, rivaled even the Mongol Khan. For two and a half centuries, Russian rulers had paid the Khan for the privilege of power. In 1480, Ivan of Moscow cut the Mongols off. Ivan III eventually said, no, we're not going to pay tribute anymore. As if you were our overlords, we will simply not do this anymore and see what you can do about it. Faced with a united Russian front, the Tatar armies could no longer dominate the battlefield or the Rus. The Mongol Khan abandoned control of Russia to Moscow and her Grand Prince. Prince Ivan III had united the Russians under the banner of Muscovy and beaten back the Mongol horde. Soon Ivan would take a new title for himself, Tsar absolute imperial ruler of all the Russians. In 1453, Constantinople, the holy city of Orthodox Christianity, fell to Muslim invaders. The Eastern Roman Empire, Byzantium, was dead. A new empire, a new emperor, would soon arise. In the Orthodox Christian citadel of Moscow, Grand Prince Ivan III began to transform his dominion into a holy Russian empire. For centuries, the Byzantine double eagle had been the symbol of absolute authority. Ivan now claimed it as his personal emblem. To lift his line to imperial blood, he took a wife, Zoye, a niece of the last Byzantine emperor. Moscow's royal family even devised a new family tree, tracing their line back to Rome and the Caesars. Ivan III's wife was quite influential in telling him, you no longer need to be the first among equals, but you need to be the autocrat, the czar, the Caesar. And so, in 1493, the Muscovite prince began to adopt the imperial title of the Byzantine emperors, Tsar. Russian for Caesar. As Prince Ivan remodeled himself as a Russian Caesar, he remade Moscow and its Kremlin into a new Rome, an imperial, holy city. Ivan brought in the finest architects from Italy. He charged them to raise monuments to God's glory and Moscow's power. The Kremlin becomes a sacred Christian center. That is where the great cathedrals of Moscow are built. You might liken it to the imperial city in Beijing and, and the Chinese emperor's sacred inner city. For a finale, Ivan's architects enlarged and restructured the Kremlin fortress itself. They encircled it with stone ramparts 16 feet thick 
and crowned by 19 towers. A royal city within the city, filled with palaces, armories and churches. In the endless lands outside Moscow, Ivan the Great also began to change the rules of life for Russia's rural majority. Once, peasants had been free to farm wherever they found open land. By paying tax or tribute, they could grow crops on fields belonging to noblemen or the church. If the land grew tired or taxes too heavy, the farmers moved to greener pastures. Tsar Ivan issued decrees crippling the peasants' traditional right to roam. Now, only once a year, in the depths of the frigid Russian winter, could peasants leave one landlord for the fields of another. The peasants were not yet serfs, slaves bound to the land, but Ivan had begun their journey into bondage. Ivan's death in 1505 would bring his son Vasily to the throne. And perhaps the most historic act Vasily Ivanich would make was not as an empire builder, but as a lover. Behind the gates of a convent, the prince locked away his first wife, Salomea. She had failed to give him a child, and so he took a new bride, Yelena. The Orthodox Patriarch of Jerusalem condemned Vasily's sinful second marriage. You will have a wicked son. Your states will be prey to terror and tears. Rivers of blood will flow. Your cities will be devoured in flames. The Patriarch's fearful prophecy would prove all too true. August 25th, 1530. The omens were awesome at the birth of Prince Vasily's son. Legend says the sky split open and lightning struck the Kremlin the night Ivan IV, heir to the Russian throne, was born. Bells spread the news across the land. Far to the east, a Tatar prince, the Khan of Kazan, warned that Russia's new prince was born a monster. A sovereign has been born to you, and he already has two teeth. With one, he will devour us. With the other, he will devour you. The tyrant history would remember as Ivan the Terrible had been born. But almost from birth, young Ivan was a prisoner of the Kremlin and its intrigues. The death of his father Vasily, when Ivan was only three, set off a deadly power struggle. The young Grand Prince watched as Russia's powerful noblemen, the boyars, fought for control. Moscow's high priest, the Metropolitan, was battered and broken before his eyes. The boyars ruled. They ruled very poorly. Each one of these cliques tried to steal as much as possible, to grab as much property as possible, to break the treasury. Between his birth and by the time he came of age, in 1547 and became crown Tsar, there are at least 14 murders that took place. Bitter intrigues swept the Kremlin. Even Ivan's mother, his crown regent, may have been a victim. She died when he was just seven, poisoned, some claimed, by rivals trying to seize the powers of the throne. As he came of age in a climate of violence, Ivan soon showed a cruel streak. When he became an adolescent, he was quite wild. Sometimes he would amuse himself by throwing dogs and cats out of the belfry of the Ivan the Great Cathedral. So the cruelty had been nurtured in him from his childhood. Whenever he could, he escaped outside the Kremlin. He hunted, he read, and he plotted his revenge. According to some accounts, it was at a Christmas banquet in 1543 that the 13-year-old prince made his first deadly play for power. His rival boyars gorged themselves. The young prince Ivan stood up and accused the powerful Shuisky family and others of treachery. You have all conspired to steal my throne, the boy said. But I will be satisfied if one among you, 
Prince Andrei Shuisky is punished. He had a kennel and he kept dogs. And one time, when Andrei Shuisky was walking in the Kremlin, Ivan told the kennel master to sick the dogs on him, and the dogs ripped Prince Shuisky apart. Shuisky's death was Ivan's warning to boyars who dared usurp his powers. If wearing the crown called for terror, Ivan was ready, ready to reign with a ruthless hand, even if it called for blood. Murder, intrigue, treachery. Prince Ivan of Moscow came of age watching boyars wage a ruthless struggle for the power of his crown. When the time came to claim his birthright, the Grand Prince made it clear. The boyar struggle was over. The crown and the power belonged to Ivan alone. January 1547. The cathedrals of the Kremlin glittered with splendor for the coronation of Ivan Vasilievich. Not content to be crowned merely Grand Prince, 16-year-old Ivan reached into the past for the authority of an emperor. He resurrected a title used only occasionally by his grandfather, Ivan the Great, the old Russian word for Caesar, Tsar. The formal adoption of a coronation ceremony of Ivan IV as Tsar was part of the process of transition from a Muscovite principality to a Russian Empire. The term Tsar is not an official title. Uh, it's not going to become an official title for the Russian rulers, the Muscovite rulers, until Ivan the Terrible in 1547. The first prince formally crowned Tsar, Ivan's imperial title echoed the awesome scope of his realm. From the Ural Mountains at Europe's eastern edge to the headwaters of the great Dnieper and Volga rivers, Russia already spanned close to a million square miles, twice as large as England, France, and Spain combined. And across all that land, one man reigned supreme. Under Ivan, all power was concentrated in the hands of the Tsar. The aristocracy held no hereditary land or power. The nobles, called boyars, owed their post and authority directly to Tsar Ivan. Nobody had any individual rights that he was born with. These people, boyars, they were made by the state, appointed by the state, and if the ruler felt like it, could be removed by the state. And everybody knew it. The Tsar's powers were absolute, a tradition Ivan's successors would defend to the death of the Russian Empire. If we are to say that our people still, to this day, have some affinity for the monarchy, the foundation for this was laid by Ivan the Terrible. He preached the ideology of autocracy. Even with all Russia at his command, Ivan wanted more. He dispatched armies to expand his dominion, east and west. Under its new Tsar, the land commonly called Muscovy would become a nation of nations, a true empire. Usually when one talks about empire, one talks about absorbing other kingdoms and making them part of one's own dominion. And that's what Russia really did for the first time in the mid-16th century. In 1552, Ivan and his army lay siege to the Tatar stronghold of Kazan. The fortress of the Khan commanded the Lower Volga, the Viking trade route to the riches of the Orient. Ivan prayed before holy relics while his warriors stormed the gates. The Tatar fortress fell. Ivan's eastern armies never looked back. By 1556, Russia ruled the Volga River route all the way to the Caspian Sea. Kazan and Astrakhan, lands that had long been the Tatars' home, now belonged to the Tsar of Russia. 
during the reign of Ivan the Terrible, he expanded at the rate of something like, on the average, 50 square miles per day during his reign. That was an extraordinary thing, uh, a feat uh, bested only by Americans in their drive toward uh, the Pacific from another coast. To commemorate his victories, Ivan erected a spectacular holy tribute in the heart of Moscow. The Cathedral of Vasily Blazhenya, St. Basil the Blessed. A masterpiece of art and architecture, St. Basil's would become a symbol of Russia itself. Ivan's passion for land and power was matched in those years by passion for his wife, Anastasia. His bride came from a family destined for the pinnacle of greatness. Anastasia was born a Romanov. When she was his wife, the Tsaritsa, he loved her very much. There were no executions. He behaved very well. All of his contemporaries remember this as the finest time of his reign. Tsar Ivan was in his glory. His court was rich and strong, his empire expanding. His influence was sought by the Poles, the Germans, the Turks, even the English. And in 1554, his wife, Anastasia Romanova, delivered the Tsar a healthy heir to the throne, a Tsarevich, Ivan Ivanich. Then, in 1560, fate seemed to turn against Ivan. A devastating fire swept across Moscow. Anastasia fell sick with a terrible fever. The Tsar prayed for God to spare his beloved. His plea was met only by Anastasia's death. A new and terrifying Ivan emerged from the ordeal. The fears of his youth revived. Poison had taken his mother. Had Anastasia been poisoned too? Was his throne now the object of a dark conspiracy? After the death of Anastasia, that particular death is really part and parcel of a much larger complex of which Ivan no longer can begin to trust completely the Boyer families that are around him. The Tsar turned on his advisors. Military heroes, trusted noblemen, they were cast into prison, subjected to torture, banishment, or worse. A bitter saying was born, the closer to the Tsar, the closer to death. The Tsar came to be known as Ivan Grozny, a word that translates as awesome or dread, but most commonly as terrible. The nickname terrible came from Ivan Vasilievich Grozny himself. In his own essays, he would state, a Tsar has to inspire terror. That is, he wanted to be called that. The Tsar of Terror alienated even his closest allies. In 1564, Ivan's top general, Andrei Kurbsky, fled the field of battle and defected to Russia's enemies. Soon after, an angry letter from General Kurbsky arrived at the Tsar's court. Monarch, who was once blessed by the Lord, but who is now corrupt to the depths of his soul, why have you murdered the illustrious warriors whom heaven had given you? Kurbsky's accusations fueled Ivan's rage to the breaking point. All of this together seems to intimate to Ivan that he still has very real internal enemies. Finally, on a December day in 1564, Tsar Ivan threw his empire out the door. Faced with another power struggle, he chose instead to quit the Kremlin. He appealed in a letter to the Moscow people, complaining that he was leaving the post of Tsar because he was not being allowed to rule that they are stealing, and he is not being allowed to punish them. The Tsar wasn't just going on a trip. He was moving out for good. With a heart filled with sorrow, no longer wishing to endure your betrayals, 
We have given up governing the country, and have left to settle in whatever place God may lead us. Ivan Grozny, Ivan the Awesome, the Dread, Ivan the Terrible, had renounced his throne. The Empire had no Tsar, the people no master. Russia was lost in the snows of a dreadful winter. December 1564. Tsar Ivan IV abandoned the Kremlin and renounced his crown. Ivan had been Russia's sovereign for over 30 years. Without the Tsar, the Russian people feared the country would fall apart, which was just what Ivan was counting on. By abdicating, he removes himself from the religious and also the political constraints that bound him when he was an official Tsar. This was a coup d'etat, which he performed because he knew he was going to be asked back to be the Tsar. He knew that the mood of the people was against the boyars, especially the people in Moscow. The people uh, came to him and they said in one of the classic Russian phrases, something to the effect that sheep cannot be without a shepherd. Uh, you may do whatever you want. Ivan agreed to return, but only on one condition. He must have a free hand to rule Russia as he pleased and punish his enemies any way he chose. Two days after Ivan's return, the terror began. At the foot of the Kremlin walls, Ivan slaughtered his so-called enemies. He ordered the execution of hundreds, nobles, counselors, even priests. They had opposed his wars, denied his taxes, questioned his sanity. They paid with their lands and their lives. To crush all opposition, the Tsar unleashed his own private army, the Oprichniki, 6,000 murderous thugs. They were cloaked in black and free to slaughter any who questioned Ivan's dark disorder. These were people recruited from some dregs of society who could ride a horse. And these people put a death's head on the pommel of their horse and would go around terrorizing the population. In a distinctly Russian version of the Spanish Inquisition, Ivan Zoprishniki spread a reign of holy terror. They would dress like monks. They would act as though they were in some kind of quasi-monastery. And yet, at the same time, they would be engaged in terrible killings. Uh, they would be engaged in terrible tortures. Tsar Ivan himself, it is said, developed a connoisseur's appreciation for torture. He would sometimes even invent special executions, which were not just executions, but also showpieces. For example, he would blow monks up on top of a powder keg. He would say, you want to be like the angels? Well, here you go. Ivan's atrocities fused with mysticism. To purge the earth of his enemies, he would massacre not just noble boyars, but their entire families. What it does is to leave no one of the family to pray for the dead. And by leaving no one to pray for the dead, it's as though Ivan was stretching his power into God's world, into the heavens or perhaps into hell. As his crusade of terror swept the land, only madmen, or the most devout, dared to challenge the Tsar. As Ivan approached the city of Pskov, this holy man, this holy fool, came up before Ivan and offered him some raw meat dripping with blood. And Ivan said, I do not eat meat during Lent. And the holy fool said, but you drink Christian blood. For nearly eight years, the Tsar waged war on his own people. When Russia's real enemies attacked, the nation was too weak to resist. In 1571, Russia's age-old nemesis, the Tatars, capitalized on Ivan's terror. Tatar warriors swept north out of the Crimea and sacked Moscow. Flame engulfed the wooden metropolis. 
In three hours, the city burned to the ground. Over 60,000 people died in a day. In the aftermath of the Holocaust, Ivan's madness seemed to burn out. Faced with a ruined capital and a shattered land, the Tsar abolished his terrible army of black riders. But the damage had already been done. The brutality of the Oprichniki, coupled with disaster and disease in years to come, would devastate the heart of Muscovy. If we are to believe the statistics that have survived, some of the areas of Muscovy are 50%, 60%. Some of them are 80 and 90% depopulated. Still, Ivan's fiery passions were far from spent. Since the death of his first wife, Anastasia, he had married so many times the Orthodox Church would no longer bless the ceremony. Ivan's amorous intentions even extended to England's royal court. He actually investigates the possibility of a marriage proposal to Mary of Hastings, who was a lady-in-waiting in Elizabeth's court and who is related to Elizabeth herself. And this too would have made for a rather strange juxtaposition, Moscow and London in the age of Shakespeare. The Tsar had no need of a wife to breed an heir. The succession was assured. Ivan's eldest son, the Tsarevich, shared his father's lust for knowledge and power. Some say even for torture. But on a November evening in 1581, Ivan's terrible passions devoured his joy. The Tsar had never been happy with his son's choice for a bride. This night, disapproval boiled over into bloodshed. Ivan was furious at the dress of his daughter-in-law and was furious at the way she behaved towards him, which he took to be as a sign of disrespect and possibly may have begun to manhandle her. Shocked, Ivan's son and heir turned on his father. The Tsar responded in fury. Blind with rage, Ivan struck out with his heavy iron staff. The Tsarevich, the son of his great love, Anastasia, struck dead by Ivan himself. With the death of his heir, Ivan's life seemed to unravel. Accounts say the Tsar felt haunted by the thousands he'd had killed, not least the murder of his own beloved son. He had executed a great number of people, and as a religious person, he tried to seek absolution for this sin, the terror. As part of that, he ordered that the names of all those who perished during the terror be written down. According to legends, at the age of 53, Ivan convened a congress of mystics and stargazers to peer into the future. What they foresaw was his death. They even named the date, March 18, 1584. Ivan was playing chess on the eve of the 18th. Not long before midnight, the Tsar fell dead. Tsar Ivan the Terrible had raised Muscovy from a kingdom to an empire. But Ivan's very own brutality had destroyed the son and heir he had raised to lead Russia after his death. Ivan had shattered a royal line that stretched back over seven centuries, and the empire he had worked so hard to build hurtled into chaos. For decades, Tsar Ivan the Terrible had held Russia together with the force of will and fear. Then, in 1584, Ivan died. His reign of terror was over, but the chaos had only just begun. The Russians themselves would call the early 1600s Smutnoya Vremya, the time of troubles. 
time of troubles was really a very traumatic and disastrous time. The country has gone through <clears throat> terrible upheavals uh, in the terror. Famine, disease, all of these things. So everything that could go wrong did go wrong. It's a disaster. Uh, it's a catastrophe. I don't think there's any other way to explain it. A vicious cycle of hardship spread chaos and despair across the land. To survive, peasants ate grass, bark. Some records claimed they even turned to cannibalism. Russia's rulers fared little better. Fyodor Ivanich, Boris Gudunov, Fyodor Gudunov, Vasily Shuisky. Between 1598 and 1610, six different men claimed the title Tsar, only to die or be deposed. The Kremlin grew so shaky, the throne fell prey to an outright imposter. The pretender came from Poland, claiming to be Tsar Ivan's long-lost heir. The charlatan wore the crown for a year before he was exposed and sent home, Russian style. The Russians killed him, burned his corpse, stuffed his ashes in a cannon, pointed it at Poland, and lit the fuse. After that, things only got worse. In the south, Tatar raids and peasant revolts shattered Moscow's authority. In the north, Sweden, the greatest military power of the day, invaded from the Baltic coast. Then, the Poles flooded across the border. Their armies drove deep into the Russian heartland. In 1610, they captured Moscow. The King of Poland stood poised to add the throne of the Tsars to his dominions. Russia was on the brink of obliteration. There's a real possibility that a Pole will sit on the Russian throne. And that, I think, more than anything, stirs nationwide revolt. In the dungeon of the Kremlin, the Poles imprisoned Russia's last national authority, the Patriarch of the Orthodox Church. Not far from death, the Patriarch issued a desperate plea. He begged the Russian people to rise up and save their motherland. Noblemen and peasants alike heard the call and banded together. A national militia arose to retake Moscow. After two years of fighting and blood sacrifice, the improvised Russian army liberated Moscow from the Poles. Victorious in saving their capital, the Russian people knew, now more than ever, they needed a Tsar to survive. The militia's leader, Dmitry Pozharsky. Without a sovereign, how can we defend ourselves against our common enemies, the Poles, the Swedes, and Russian rogues who stir up strife? Nobles, merchants, warriors, priests, they assembled to choose a new Tsar. They sought divine authority a devout Orthodox monarch with blood ties to Ivan the Terrible. In a monastery far from Moscow, they tracked down a distant relative of Tsar Ivan's first wife, a 16-year-old boy, Mikhail Fyodorovich Romanov. Young Michael at first refused the crown, then bowed to pressure and ambition. July 1613, Mikhail Romanov was crowned Grand Prince of Moscow autocrat and Tsar of all the Russias. It was the birth of three centuries of Romanov family rule. Any dynasty which survives 300 years is successful. You know, this is one of the great European dynastic regimes, one of the great European families. The Romanovs uh, spawned a whole series of Tsars and Tsarinas uh, who were, um, uh, who reformed Russia, who brought Russia into the modern world, who made of her a world power. Under the first two Tsars of the new Romanov dynasty, Moscow began to reassert control over Russia and her people. Any nobleman who dared challenge central authority faced exile or the loss of his lands. In return for their loyalty, the nobles were soon awarded unprecedented control over the peasants who worked their fields. The chaotic time of troubles had opened a window for the peasants. For years, they walked away from lands, debts, and landlords. The exodus crippled farms across Russia and destroyed the nation's economy. Moscow's solution? 
serfdom. And what serfdom really is in the law code of 1649 is to give any landholder unlimited time to re find and return a runaway peasant. And that is, from that point onwards, it's understood that a peasant on these estates is to be considered a serf. Free Russians had been made serfs, slaves, the legal property of the nobles who owned the land. The new law bound peasants, their children, and their children's children to the fields for life. Serfdom, the enslavement of their own people, would haunt the empire and the Romanov dynasty until its demise. The second Romanov Tsar, Alexis Mikhailovich, set other, more promising trends in motion as well. He opened Russia's borders to trade with the West. His armies pushed Russia's eastern border all the way to the Pacific. And even then, Russia's thirst to expand was far from finished. But it was a kind of drive to the sea. The Russians saw that their fate as a nation was to reach the Pacific Ocean, uh, to go north up to, uh, to go north to the Baltic Sea, to go south to the Black Sea, and that that was what they were destined by geography to do. Russia's thrust for the Black Sea would shape war and peace for centuries. And the quest for the Baltic would become the driving obsession of Tsar Alexei's heir, Peter the Great. May 30th, 1672, Moscow erupted in celebration. The Tsar's new wife had given birth to a healthy new prince, a boy who would fall in love with boats and war and ideas and power a boy called Peter. It was clear young Pyotr Alexeyevich would make a perfect Tsar. The problem was he wasn't the next in line for the throne. Peter's father, Tsar Alexei Mikhailovich, sired two families with two different wives. Peter's half-brothers, Fyodor and Ivan, were both ahead of him in the succession. But there was one other member of the family determined to break tradition and seize the crown for herself, Peter's half-sister, Sophia. She was educated uh, beyond what women had usually been educated, um, and uh, she was a very smart woman. In fact, she was probably the best choice among all the Romanovs to rule Russia well. At Tsar Alexei's death, Sophia's brother Fyodor took the throne, only to die soon after. Now Peter's family reached for the crown. With the blessing of the church, Peter's uncles prepared to make the ten-year-old boy the new Tsar. But Sophia had other plans, plans that would leave Peter scarred forever. At Fyodor's funeral, Sophia planted a vicious rumor. People, see how our brother Tsar Fyodor has suddenly gone from this world? His enemies have disposed of him. Sophia's rumor hit the Kremlin like a bomb. Elite musketeers in the army, the Streltsy, cried for the blood of Peter's family. Peter was 10 years old, and he witnessed things that no 10-year-old should ever have witnessed. Having his uncles, many of the family's closest friends, his father's chief of state, having them all dragged out of their chambers, having them thrown onto upturned pikes and then having their bodies dragged to the center of Red Square uh, and hacked to pieces. Uh, for three days, uh, Peter and his mother had no idea whether they would live or die. Peter was spared because he was of the royal blood. He was the Tsar. To kill the legitimate Tsar would have been a terrible sin. Sophia couldn't kill Peter so she took power with a cunning compromise. Russia would crown not one Tsar, but two, Peter I and his half-brother Ivan V. But big sister Sophia would be their crown regent and the real power behind the throne, literally. 
and there's even a good visual image of this. There's a two-seated throne that was made for the boy Kozars, Peter and Ivan, except behind Peter's seat there's a little window. And so Sophia would sit back there and whisper suggestions to the young Peter. Although Sophia pulled the strings, tradition kept her from wearing the crown. She was never crowned Tsarina. Russia was not ready for this yet, even though they would have a woman at the helm not far after the death of Peter. But she was still running the scenes as regent while Peter was a young boy. Having escaped the bloodbath with his life, Peter abandoned the capital. And while Sophia built a power base in the Kremlin, young Peter built his own stronghold from scratch. From childhood, the boy Tsar loved to tinker and build. He sought out craftsmen who taught him to work wood, metal, and stone. As he turned 13, Peter built a wooden fortress in the fields outside Moscow. Then he built an army to attack it, an army of boys, 300 strong. I think he, in fact, had considerable freedom to do what he wanted, and what he wanted was essentially war games. He gets interest in all manner of military things, and, and he starts building up a sort of mini-play army of sorts. The sons of nobles and commoners alike were drummed into Peter's ferocious war games. Though the cannonballs were made of leather, the cannon were real. At one skirmish, 24 young soldiers were killed. Peter's games were deadly serious. The boy Tsar was preparing to save his life and his crown, a crown Sophia had begun to treat as her own. Peter's half-sister now claimed the regal title Great Sovereign. She posed for a portrait wearing the Tsar's royal regalia. She entertained foreign dignitaries and negotiated alliances. She used her brother Ivan as her front man, but she couldn't ignore her half-brother Peter. Peter, when he was a child, and Sophia, uh, obviously hated each other for political reasons. Uh, they were in two different political camps. By the age of 17, Pyotr Alexeyevich Romanov was poised to take power. The boy Tsar had grown into a six-foot, seven-inch giant, backed up by two regiments of the finest troops in Russia. His presence was just overwhelming to people, and uh, in many ways he terrified people with his presence. And then you combine that with his temper, and uh, he was a formidable character. In 1689, Peter unleashed his temper on Sister Sophia's designs on the crown. In a letter to his half-brother and half-tsar, Ivan, Peter threw down the gauntlet. Sovereign brother, the time has come for us to rule the realm entrusted to us by God. It is disgraceful that this shameful person should rule the state in our stead. August 1689. Rumors that Sophia and the Streltsy were preparing to strike first precipitated a new showdown. And this time, Peter was no longer a helpless child. When the showdown occurred, practically everyone supported Peter. Even the Streltsy. Uh, some of the regiments wavered, but nonetheless they supported Peter and did not support Sophia. The great sovereign Sophia's power base evaporated in the face of Tsar Peter's bold gambit. In the end, Peter treated his half-sister like any woman who crossed its Tsar. He banished her from public life and ultimately forced her to take the veil. Sofia Alexeyevna Romanova, the woman who dared to grab the power of the Tsar, would spend the rest of her life as a nun, imprisoned behind convent walls. In the late 17th century, in the kingdom called Muscovy, two brothers sat on the throne of the Tsar. The brother Tsars, Ivan V and Peter I, ruled a far-flung empire of isolated villages, cities and towns, a place where daily life had changed little since the Middle Ages. In the 17th century, Muscovy was definitely stuck in a medieval time warp, and it seemed backward by any measures. Um, Muscovite Russia had not experienced the Renaissance. It had not experienced the scientific revolution of the 17th century. 
Born in a medieval environment, the young Tsar Peter was captivated by everything modern. Anything new, anything from the West, people, ideas, even clothes. In 1696, Peter's half-brother and co-Tsar, Ivan V, died. As Pyotr Alexeyevich Romanov assumed sole control of the Russian throne, he declared his lifelong goal. To break the bonds of the inflexible customs of Muscovy and to lead this country toward a new day which shall be better than this. And for Peter, Russia's new day dawned not in the East, but in the West, in Europe. There was no alternative in the end, because if one was going to survive, you had to westernize, because the alternative to westernizing was essentially to be run over by one's European neighbors. For Peter, one thing above all symbolized the new Russia he hoped to build. Ships, warships, transports, merchant ships. As Tsar, Peter would build his fascination into a navy, a force that would change Russia and the world. Peter had a passion for all sorts of knowledge, but shipbuilding from a young age was something that just fascinated him. And he learned everything he could possibly learn about shipbuilding. But as a potential maritime power, Peter's kingdom had one crippling drawback. Russia, the largest nation on earth, was practically landlocked. In the north, Sweden and Poland held the Baltic coast. In the south, the Ottoman Empire encircled the Black Sea. Peter wanted a seaport for Russia, a window on the world and the West. He wanted to take Russia out of its Muscovite isolation and backwardness and communicate with the West, uh, communicate with them in terms of technology, in terms of ideas, uh, in terms of exchanging goods. And for that, he needed warm water ports. At 23, the Tsar set his sights on the Black Sea's warm waters and the Turkish stronghold of Azov. 1695. Peter and his army marched south on Azov. The Tsar posted himself to the front-line artillery. Peter, from almost day one of the Azov campaign, is seeing action. Uh, and that continues for most of his life. He's very much a guy who wants to be where the action is and does not uh, spare himself, is, is willing to be out there and be in danger. But even with the warrior Tsar manning the guns, the Turks sent Russia home in defeat. The setback gave Peter a new insight. To capture the naval outpost he craved, first he needed a navy to lead the attack. The Tsar ordered up a fleet of battle galleys. He needed them finished in five months. But Russia had never been a naval power. First, they had to build shipyards and train the builders before they could build the ships. Peter himself led the effort. He was right there hammering nails and building. And it was through him that Russia's first navy was created. Uh, no, nothing resembling a navy had ever existed before Peter. Next spring, the untested Russian flotilla cruised down the River Don, Peter himself at the helm of his flagship. He insisted his men not call him Tsar or Admiral, but simply Captain. On land, the Russian army again attacked the Turks at Azov. And from the sea, Peter and his new navy backed the troops with a withering naval bombardment. Considering that the first campaign had been a failure and had had very serious heavy losses, the second time was a piece of cake. So in that sense, he starts a pattern of even though he might fail initially, he still won't give up on his objective. Uh, militarily speaking, he'll come back even stronger real quick. A taste of naval power had at last won Russia a port on the Black Sea. But Peter wanted more. He wanted the secrets of the high-tech warships of the great Western navies. And so the Tsar of Russia left his kingdom to seek out the know-how he craved. No Tsar had ever before set foot outside the kingdom. No Tsar had ever even seen Europe. Peter was going to shatter tradition. The winter of 1697, 
Peter and some 200 nobles, craftsmen, musicians, servants, and a troop of dwarves headed west on a year and a half long European road trip. To escape the tedious burdens of royalty, the Tsar himself often masqueraded as a common sailor. He wanted to absorb as much knowledge as he possibly could without the trappings of uh, formality and court ritual and all of that. So he wanted to, you know, observe unnoticed. It was kind of difficult to be unnoticed, at, you know, at his height. But he didn't want, you know, didn't want to be known as the czar. He just wanted to be known as a traveling student. For a self-taught craftsman, Western Europe offered the ultimate education. He studied printing, iron casting, paper making, even how to render whale blubber. He took classes in surgery and anatomy in Leiden, art in Leipzig, and dentistry in Dresden. He was kind of a jack of all trades. He had such a passion for life and for experimentation that he not only wanted Russia to build a navy, but he wanted to learn how to be a shipbuilder himself. He wanted not only more Western style, more Western standards of medicine, but he himself practiced dentistry and practiced on some of his unfortunate men. I'm sure that his talents were pretty much limited to pulling out people's teeth, and <laughs> that was about it. He was an observing an anatomy course in Holland, and uh, they produced a dissected corpse. And all his comrades grew really squeamish when that happened. I mean, they were just repulsed by this, because it was just an unusual thing at the time. And Peter was just mortified at their squeamishness. He was uh, embarrassed and angry, and uh, in retaliation against it, he made every one of them stand up, march down to the table, and take a bite out of the corpse. It was, uh, it was just his way of saying, stop it. Peter's greatest hunger was for nautical science. In Holland's finest shipyard, he apprenticed himself to a master shipwright. Then, Russia's carpenter czar learned how to build a 28-gun frigate from the keel up. But even with a Dutch ship of the line to his credit, Peter wasn't satisfied. The British ruled the seas, so the Tsar headed for England. He knows the reputation also of the British fleet, and the British very much cultivate that, they, so they provide a, a um, craft for him to sail on the Thames, and although he rams a couple of other vessels while he's learning to pilot this vessel, he does uh, enjoy this, and he, at the end of this all says that uh, uh, all things being equal, he'd really rather be an admiral in the British Navy than anything else. The English offered Peter a fine manor house for his stay. The Tsar's host would come to regret the hospitality. And they tear the place up. They, they mess up the plantings, the hedge. <laughs> they shoot up the house. A few months later, a bill which was presented for damages caused to the house by the Russians. And, and these damages included paintings on the walls which had had shots fired into them, paving stones ripped up, wi windows smashed, furni furniture soiled in various ways. He was, in, on some levels, a frat boy, you know, in, in that he would just uh, drink, drink himself silly. And uh, he would, you know, often on, while he was on tour around Russia, he would, I mean, in, around uh, Western Europe, he would be uh, visiting people's houses and they were, it just left a wake of destruction uh, behind him. When the rowdy Russians wore out their welcome in one land, they moved on to the next. July 1698, after 16 months on the road, Peter's entourage was partying in Vienna when an urgent message arrived from Moscow. Emboldened by Tsar Peter's extended absence, reactionary Streltsy regiments were stirring up revolt yet again. Peter's European apprenticeship ended abruptly. The jack-of-all-trades Tsar headed home to assert himself as Russia's unquestioned taskmaster. For 16 months, Tsar Peter I had reveled in the shipyards and palaces of Western Europe. When he returned home in 1698 and compared his realm with the West, Russia's supreme autocrat wasn't happy. His capital, Moscow, struck Peter as primitive and gloomy. Russia's nobility, the boyars, seemed medieval in their long beards and caftans. The Orthodox Church wielded far too much power 
at the Tsar's expense. And to top it off, the Streltsy, the army's die-hard conservative musketeers, were in open revolt. Peter resolved to change it all. He dreamed of a new nation, a westernized Russia, an empire inspired by and wedded to Europe, a gilded land of order, progress, and power. He started his revolution with a little barbering. He was known to rip people's beards right out with his bare hands uh, at the roots. And beards to him were just something that said old barbaric way. It was a tangible way of dragging the nation forward. The Tsar ordered a complete change of clothes for his noblemen. Boyars caught in the traditional long kaftans of Muscovy had their robes cut short on the spot. What he's saying to the Russians, certainly to the Russian nobility, is you can't be very Russian anymore. You have to be Europeans. You have to re-educate yourself to act out the life of European gentlemen and gentlewomen. Peter ruffled feathers all over the place. I mean, what he, he was proposing radical changes. He wanted to drag Russia literally out of the Dark Ages, kicking and screaming with the force of his own will. If his new Russia called for blood sacrifice, the Tsar had no qualms. He saved his greatest wrath for the Streltsy, Russia's reactionary musketeers. He never really forgave the Streltsy for having murdered so many members of his immediate family. And he sentenced um, 1,182 members of the Streltsy to execution. And it was widely rumored, and I think it was true, uh, that Peter himself participated in the beheading of many of these Streltsy. One obsession would shape Peter's entire reign to create a Russian port on the Baltic coast, a window that would open Peter's kingdom to the world. But in 1700, the Baltic coast belonged to another nation and another bold young king, Charles XII of Sweden. Born and bred a warrior, Sweden's King Charles would make Peter and Russia pay dearly for his Baltic dream. The cost? the blood of thousands and 20 years of war. The duel began late in the year 1700. Peter's army, 40,000 strong, marched on Narva, the Swedes' Baltic stronghold. With only 8,000 men, Charles was outnumbered five to one. But in a blinding snowstorm, Sweden's warrior king seized the moment. Now is the time. With the storm at our backs, they will never see how few we are. The Swedes charged out of the blizzard and completely overwhelmed the Russians. Peter, who had all these dreams of making Russia a superb military power, uh, met ignominious defeat. Uh, his 34,000 soldiers uh, were trounced by Charles, uh, Charles's army of 8,000. Convinced that Russia was a paper tiger, Charles turned west to attack Poland. He would save Tsar Peter for later. What Narva did to Peter is to convince him that all of the resources of the vast country which was under his control had to be put to serve one purpose and one purpose only, and that was to build Russia into a military power.